All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the League Express podcast. My name is Jake Keenan, and joining me as always is the editor of League Express, Martin Sadler. Martin, how was your weekend? Hi, Jake. Well, not bad at all. And of course, it was um, enhanced by England's thrilling win over Tonga, which was the the best of the three wins. And they, we scored some terrific tries, 26 points to four. Um, you know, really marvellous performance by England. Um, it really gets me, though, that, you know, a lot of people are now saying, well, Tonga weren't that good, really. Um, and the, But the point is that Tonga was a team made up almost entirely of NRL players who play regularly first grade in uh, in, in, in the NRL. Um, so they were very good, but we were just, you know, England were just a better side. Uh, and I think you've hit on it, really, haven't you? I think... Um, your point is that the England spine was stronger than, mm. than the Tongan one. And I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, um, you know, Harry Smith, I think, has been brilliant mm. in this series. And I'd be very surprised if um, the eyes of NRL clubs were not uh, on him mm. um, with a view to, you know, making him a an offer to go to the NRL. And I'd be very, I'd be amazed if that's, not where he ends up at some stage. Mm, absolutely. And Sean almost silenced the critics a little bit in that game three. I think there was a no bit doubt. of criticism around um, the lack of attack and flair, but they certainly showed that in game three. That game was a triumph for Sean Wayne. I mean, of all the, you know, we can talk about the 17 players who played for England, but <clears throat> but the most triumphant guy is definitely Sean Wayne um, because his side did play brilliant rugby. Um and not just that, he brought back George Williams as the captain um, after George's two-game suspension. And that was, you know, that could have backfired, couldn't it? Uh, if, if England hadn't won that game, then there would have been criticism of that decision as he, to, to bring him back to replace Mikey Lewis. Uh, Mikey Lewis wasn't in the matchday squad at all. Um, and, of course, he replaced Jack Wellesby as the um, England captain. But... It all worked to perfection, mm. and you've got to say, you know, I, I must admit that I, you know, Sean Wayne was desperately disappointed, as was I, uh, by their semi-final defeat in the World Cup last year to Samoa, um, and I, I, I wondered whether Sean, you know, still had what it takes to, to be the England coach, but you know, this test has come through with flying colours, hasn't he? Mm. And. I don't think anybody can really contradict that. And, you know, let's roll on now to next year. Will it be Samoa? There still seems to be some uncertainty about whether it's going to be Samoa coming here next year. I hope they do, because uh, it would be great to get revenge on them for last year's semi-final defeat. And who knows? We've just got to wait and see what what, what happens. Mm, absolutely. And especially the way that Samoa played in the Pacific Championship, you'd have to think that England would be uh, quite confident heading into a series against them. You would think so. Um, but, I, you know, I wouldn't take too much for granted uh, in that regard. Um, I think Samoa are getting stronger every year and they'll be stronger next year than they are this year. They've got some mm. really great, great players. And... Uh, They'll give us a pretty good test if uh, if they do come over here. Mm, absolutely. Now the scoreline, uh, twenty six points to four. Did you expect this scoreline considering what we saw in game one and two? No, I thought it would be a closer game. Um, I, I thought the Tongans would really come out and and be desperate to win. I didn't, you know, I thought they'd be really highly motivated to go home, you know, with at least one game mm. in this series. But they, you know, they seem to. They seemed to f- fire blanks, really, to be perfectly honest, didn't they? Mm. You know, they never really looked a threat. Um, and I thought England handled them really well. And, you know, some of the England players... I thought John Bateman, for example, you know, had an absolutely wonderful game. Um, he must be the best offloader mm. in World Rugby League, I would have thought. And, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's not the biggest looking guy, isn't John Bateman? But, my God, he does play... You know, in a with such strength, mm. is 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 such a strong young guy, mm. um, much stronger than he actually looks. Really, mm. you, you, just to look at him, if you just saw him in, in the street, he's an amazing athlete, mm. and you know, it was just marvelous to see. And I think all the, you know, Elliot Whitehead playing his last game for England, it was great to see him score a try. I'm very unlucky not to, not to be given a second try by the um, the video referee. Um, so, it, you know, it couldn't have really gone better, could it, mm. uh, for, for England? And it was good to see a bigger crowd there as well. You know, 15,500 
um, at Headingley. I mean, it should have been full, really, but it was a bigger crowd than the first two games. And um, I, th- I think, it, you know, if we can re-establish Test Rugby League in October and November, I think the crowds will steadily grow again. Mm. The, the, the fact is we've not had Test Series now for for, for many years, and um, it takes the fans quite a while to get used to watching games again at this time of the year, doesn't it? Mm. So, you know, we'll see We'll see how it goes. No, absolutely. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but I just want to touch on um, John Bateman. His ability just to stand in a tackle with defenders draped all over him and absolutely. not be taken to the ground. Like, he well, must have incredible core strength just to yes. hold, him, hold himself. and then I think he's a remarkable offload. player and, and always has been. I always remember, you know, people talking about him when he was coming through the academy at Bradford. Bradford Bulls and um, people saying that you know he was a future star in the making and um, he used to dominate games as a kid and you know clearly that's that's what he does he's mm. he's amazing and you're right about his build he almost his build sort of looks like he's a more of a center than a back rower mm. but yeah he just must have incredible strength because mm. yeah I thought he was outstanding and brilliant um, you know you could almost have him in that top three um, position for. Uh, well, the shortlist for the player of the series. Obviously, Harry yeah. Smith got it, and I think he was uh, a well-deserved earner of that um, so player of the I. series medal. And um, I, I think, I think Harry Smith controls the game well. And that t- brilliant try where he kicked the ball across the field, you know, a, a ball with a low trajectory but hit mm. very hard, and uh, it went into Harry Newman's hands and mm. he scored. It was absolutely outstanding. It reminded me of a try I once saw that was... Um, created by Cooper Cronk, Cooper Cronk you know, yeah. very, very similar mm. sort of score. Mm. And uh, as I say, I mean, I, I think Harry Smith's value has probably doubled at least mm. um, in the course of this test series. And, you know, great to see the young man doing so well. I, again, I, I first saw him play um, a few years ago for the England Academy squad when Australia came over and England defeated Australia. And he was a you know a core part of that team that did that, and I always thought he was going to really make the grade. It's probably taken him longer, slightly longer. I mean, he's still a, I think he's still only twenty three, if I remember rightly. But you know, it's probably taken him longer to really become the player he is than I thought it would do at that time. But mm. yeah, he's, he's a real fine player. That's right. And sometimes for halves, it just does take a little bit longer for them to mature. It does. And it's, really... it's a hard, well. It's the key role in the game, isn't it? Mm. So, yes, it um, it would do. That's it. And a lot of the greats of the game say, you know, as a half, you only really start to hit your prime when you're 26, 27 years old. And to think that he's performing the way he is now at the you know ripe age of 23 or the young age of 23, Amazing. I should say. Um, yeah. yeah, just outstanding. So wouldn't be surprised if there was a few clubs sniffing around him to see if uh, he'd like to take a trip down under. Absolutely um, not, no. But, yeah, yeah outstanding. Um, now, looking at the Tongan side, unfortunately, uh, have gone down 3-0. Do you think there's a lot that they can take out of this side to build for the future, or do you think it's a bit of a disappointing series for them as a whole? Well, it has to be disappointing when you lose a series 3-0. Um, you know, and um, <laughs> their coach, Christian Wolf has been in charge of Tonga now for about 10 years. Mm. So, you know, he's, uh, he's had a lot of experience with them. I think he's um, a bit ambivalent now about whether he's going to continue with them, because... From 2025 onwards, he'll be the head coach at the Dolphins, won't he, mm-hmm. in, in Brisbane. And I think he probably, I, I almost get the feeling that he thinks that it would be too difficult to do the two jobs at once. Mm-hmm. So it, they, they might well hand on to somebody else, I would think. I'm not sure who that would be. Um, they will be disappointed. I mean, obviously, they were missing one or two key players, Jason Tamalolo being the obvious one. Mm-hmm. Um, but nonetheless, they they need to develop, you know, greater creativity um, in, in in the spine. Mm. And th- th- that young man, Latu Fainu, mm. who came on as a substitute, the West Tigers kid, I think he's potentially really got what it takes. Mm. And I think we'll see more of him in the in, in the future. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. But I, a, a lot of people probably underestimated England, if I'm really honest about it, um, Jake. And I think the English team... I mean, if the English team had played like that against Samoa in the semi-final last year, I think we'd have beaten them without question. Mm. 
and it's just so frustrating, you know, that that, that we didn't mm. and, and and didn't make the uh, World Cup final. Yeah, absolutely. but that's gone now. We can't do anything about it. But you know, I think there's a lot. A lot to uh, anticipate for England going forward. Mm. I think we will see a much different, I guess, squad for both teams going forward. Uh, obviously, we were saying goodbye to Elliot Whitehead. Um, Hopoade announced his retirement uh, just the other day, so mm. we won't see him in the side anymore for Tonga. Um, I wouldn't expect Lola here to feature in the Tongan side at the next World Cup. But no. I think it's now an opportunity for, if, if Christian does decide to stay on for Tonga, to reassess and maybe look at bringing in uh, Latu Fainu uh, through the halves with Isaiah Katoa for the next tournament. Um, and as you touched on, I thought when he came on uh, during the game, on the weekend, he was outstanding. His reception from dummy half was really crisp. Absolutely. Um, and I think when in the back end of the uh, second half, when he came on, it seemed like Tonga seemed to get a bit of momentum. And, and a they bit scored of a the last on. try of the game, of course, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I think there's a few things that they can take out of this series. Uh, obviously, disappointing to go down 3 0, but uh, yeah, I think the future still looks bright for Tonga. And they, oh, can't, so they, they can't get too disappointed by this. I think they still want to continue to build. But yeah, as you said, with. Wolf taking over the Dolphin from 2025. It'll be interesting to see who takes over. One thing I'd like Tonga to do, to, to think about doing, is playing at least one game in Tonga because, you know, they, they've they've played all their games outside Tonga, haven't they, mm. um, in, in recent years. And they've got incredible support and they had great support in, in this test series, um, given how far away Tonga is from England. Mm. But, um, you know, to be good for both them and Samoa and Fiji, to play some games in the, their home countries because we are trying to spread rugby league throughout those um, South Pacific nations, and I, I do think they need to play some games there. You know, even if they're, you know, not necessarily games against Australia, England, New Zealand, but maybe against the other South Pacific nations. I, I don't know what how well equipped they are for stadiums in in Tonga. Pro- probably not that great, I wouldn't think, mm. but. Um, you know, nonetheless, it would be good to see them playing some games there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there was a lot of drama surrounding this series off the field as well. There's a few people on Facebook commenta- uh, commenting that they were su- sort of uh, surprised by the what seemed to be Saints versus Wigan rivalry happening oh, between gosh, the yeah. two coaches. Never uh, be surprised at that. <laughs> no, no. So, <laughs> do you think, I think last week you touched on that it's great for the series as a whole to have that sort of drama happening in the background. Of course it is, yeah. But do you, do you feel as though maybe it sort of overshadowed some of the things of this series? Not really, no. I mean, you know, Sean Wayne is 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 a bloke who wears his heart on his sleeve. He's a very emotional guy. He, he, he doesn't react all that well to criticism, particularly when he th- thinks it's unjustified. Yeah. Um, and he can see criticism probably where nobody else can see it, to be honest. Mm. Um, but that's Sean. You know, uh, Sean's um, Sean deserves to, um, you know, uh, well, to 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 just wallow in the glow of having won this test series, doesn't he? So mm. you can't you can't argue with success. Um, I thought Christian Wolf handled it very well. He, Christian refused to rise to the bait, really, to be mm. perfectly honest. And uh, I think Christian's a very stable, level-headed sort of a guy. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how he does when he takes over at the Dolphins in in a year or so's time. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, it was like... It's always good seeing a bit of off-field fireworks. So oh, I enjoy I think it. So. so do I. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I also was had a thought over the weekend watching um, sort of the change in game plan for England. They were playing a lot more attacking football. I wonder if that was Wayne's plan going in to the series. Let's secure these first two games with our uh, defensive line speed. Let's not you know expand too much from that. And then if we do win those two, let's open it up a bit in the third game. I think he may well have done done that and and uh, i mean the the interesting thing is that england really have some players who can who who know how to attack i mean Mm. we've talked about harry smith george williams coming back into the side you know replacing um mikey lewis um then then you know you look at the england backs jack wellsby so dangerous when linking with his three quarters Mm. young harry newman at center again i think harry newman has enhanced his value in this um in this series and and i'd be surprised if um he didn't get some attention from nrl clubs in the near future Mm. um ben curry played at uh at, at center and you know i thought played quite well in that position. Mm. Ben normally, of course, a, a second rower. But, um, 
and and Tom Johnston, Tom Johnston and and Matty Ashton, you know, two fine wingers. I I, I just think, you know, we we at, at this moment in time, we're not short of really good players to um, select from in in for, for for the England side. And you know, I'd love to see England playing Australia again fairly soon, especially when you saw Australia being beaten by New Zealand. So. Hmm convincingly at the weekend yeah yeah it's uh you know, it was a it's a hard one for me to get into i'm a little bit upset as an australian supporter yeah um, but yeah we can dive into that game so obviously over the weekend we had the pacific uh cup championship uh final between new zealand and australia new zealand winning 32 nil uh quite a surprising scoreline given that you know, australia won i think it was 36 to 18 the week before um yeah what was your reaction the, in, the initial reaction to this well, New, I thought New Zealand would be much improved compared to what they were a week earlier. I thought playing at home in front of their own spectators, they'd, you know, they they would do a lot better. Um, but I didn't really expect a thirty nil scoreline, and I don't think anybody else did. Mm. Did they? You know, it was twelve nil at half time. Uh, I noticed on the TV coverage, um, they they um, they, they they had. Um, what was his name? The young Smith of uh, the oh, Brandon Smith. Brandon Smith. Yeah, I couldn't remember his first name. Um, Brandon Smith. They were winning twelve nil at half time, and he predicted a twenty four six scoreline. So he got the total number of points right, yeah. but didn't didn't get the um, their allocation very quite right. And they they really outplayed Australia. And, and the thing that amazed me uh, about that game was that. The, the Australian forwards, Payne Haas and Tino Fasamulai. F- 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, hard to say. Yeah. Um, they, they'd been so dominant uh, in previous games, um, and yet they just absolutely put the shackles around them, didn't they? Mm, yeah. Uh, fantastic performance by the Kiwis, and a great thing for Michael Maguire. I, I like Michael Maguire as a guy. I think he's, you know, very... Um, a very good coach, very engaging guy, and I was pleased for him that he was able to um, get that victory out of his side. Mm, absolutely, and like there's a lot to uh, take from this game, especially as an Australian. Uh, the, f- the first thing is when you lose by 30, it's just un-Australian. You can't let that happen when you're nope. pulling on the Australian jersey, nope. and it's our worst ever defeat to New Zealand. So um, it is. Yeah, that's the first thought. Second thought is. Um, a back-to-back game, when you win the first one, you always had a slight disadvantage heading into the second game because the team you beat sort of has that opportunity to go back to the drawing board, watch a lot of tape and figure out how do we change our game plan going into mm. this. And I really like Mike Maguire's approach, um, the way he went into this match. They sort of played with the siege mentality that they were going to go in Absolutely. and just pound and pound and pound and play expansive football. And they almost just, you know, punched, kept punching through the middle and then played off the back of that. And it just seemed like at times Australia weren't in it from the get-go. And I think Australia even went away from their game plan the week before. They tended to spread the ball wide early, get their second rowers involved early. And um, they really tried to, I guess, make New Zealand's um, defensive line shift. Absolutely. And it just seemed like, yeah, from the get-go, um, they weren't in it. And... Very disappointing, but... It's quite interesting, isn't it? When you look at the New Zealand team, I, I thought Joseph Tapini had a great game, by the way, the Canberra Raiders player. Mm. Um, but you look at their squad, and, and it, they, they have been hit by players opting to play for Tonga and Samoa, haven't they, in, in recent years? And yet their, their team, you know, on Saturday, looked stronger than ever mm. to me from from 1 to 17 really to be perfectly honest it was great to see a you know a young guy like griffin neem scoring uh, a, a try uh, towards the end of the game mm. you know kid who i'd n- never really heard of before mm. before this uh, this series and um they they look i mean i imagine that the um in, international rugby league the international governing body will probably issue some new um, international rankings fairly soon. And New Zealand, of course, have to be at the top, haven't they now? Yeah. And uh, Australia second. And um, 
and England back up to third, I think. Mm, absolutely. And I, I think just watching the game, you could tell that it was one on preparation. And mm. for Australia to bring back the likes of Payne Haas, Antino Fasu and Malawi, who were rested the week before, and still go down by a scoreline like that, I think that's just mm. extremely embarrassing. And I think a lot of Australian fans had some questions around a few key selections. I know... Uh, personally, I would have loved to have seen Reese Walsh feature at fullback. And oh, I know yes. James Tedesco is our captain, but if we're, if we're picking the team on form, Tedesco, for me, isn't the man for the number one job. I think, I think if Reese Walsh had been there, they would have been far more dangerous. Mm. And um, do you think that Mal Meninga's in danger now of um, you know, coming uh, to the end of his tenure as Australia coach? I, I don't think so. Um, and I doubt that they will sit and dwell too much on this result. Um it's not a good look, but I think that he's just he's done such a great job in the past. He's got a great reputation. He knows what it's like uh, to pull on an Australian jersey and, and sort of he instills that pride and passion in the jersey that was lacking over the weekend. But uh, I think he'll be he'll remain safe in that jersey. Obviously, Adrian Lamb's his assistant at the moment, so Absolutely, maybe yeah. he could put his hand up to uh, fill the fill. Uh, well, it'd be interesting to see what Adrian says about it all, won't it? When he when he comes back to England. Yeah, absolutely. But just another, another, like another selection, obviously, um, they went with Nico Hines in the 17 jersey alongside Harry Grant in the 14 jersey on the bench. Now, they opted to play Tom Flegler in the 18th man jersey. Mm. And when you're coming up against a big pack like James Fisher-Harris and Moses Leota, uh, Nelson Asafa solomon It didn't look smart, did it? That's right. You need, and that's what was lacking for Australia, that bit of mongrel off the bench. And that's what Tom Flegler brings. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a few key selections there I would have liked to have seen reversed. Obviously, they went with uh, Dylan Edwards on the wing, who's had a great season but hasn't played much on the wing. No. Uh, Selwyn Cobbo, obviously, uh, didn't play much at all this series. So, uh, yeah, a few changes I would have liked to have seen, but I don't think those changes would have affected the, resu- the result. No, probably not. No, no. And let me ask you as an Australian, do you think Michael Maguire has been linked Strongly with the Blues, the New South Wales Blues. Do you think he could do two jobs? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, and that performance over the weekend makes me extremely worried as a Queensland fan, mm. uh, just because he executed a perfect game plan. And um, yeah, I would. The thing is with Madge is it would just be a, a short term contract. I, I hope if the Blues do go with him, uh, they they sort of stick with him for longer than two or three years because mm. you need time to build a culture. And I've heard a lot of players talk about playing under Madge and there's no denying he's one of the toughest coaches to play for. His pre-seasons mm. are almost torturous. Uh, <laughs> Not almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's... Um, and I'm pretty sure Sam Burgess could attest to that, uh, playing under him at the South Sydney Rabbitohs. So... Um, yeah, and I remember hearing Ben Teo talk about some of the torturous army camps they were put through mm. in his time at the Bunnies. So, um, yeah, it makes me worried as a Queenslander, uh, the possibility of him taking over the Blues. And, um, yeah, I think the Kiwis would be trying desperately to retain him yes. going forward after the weekend. And one thing I do want to say is, yes, the Australians lost by 30 points, but we can't take anything away from how good this Kiwi side is at the moment. Not like, at all, As you no. touched on, it's a very good one to 17. <laughs> And they deserve all the credit in the world. The one disappointment, of course, about the game was the crowd was only 13,269. And um, the the TV cameras were facing a stand that looked pretty empty, really. Mm. And that was disastrous for the image of International Rugby League. Um, I I think if... um, and, And I think that sort of illustrates that, you know... They need to learn if if we're going to have the Pacific Cup every year, which which I hope we are, and I think it's a great innovation. Um, they need to understand how to promote it more effectively mm. and and to get some full houses because to to get you know a, a crowd of that modest figure to watch the two best sides in the world mm. isn't really good enough, is it? To be perfectly honest, and um, and the other thing about the game is, of course, it, it sort of il- illustrates the point that you know when are we going to have a second New Zealand side in the NRL? There's got to be one at some mm. stage, surely. Absolutely, you know, because um, there's so much talent in New Zealand, and it's growing all the time. And we, we, you know, we need surely to have a 
a second side there to be able to take advantage of that. Mm, absolutely. And the thing with the, the marketing around this is obviously the CBA uh, negotiations really held up any future of international fixtures. But the fact that like the CBA agreement um, sort of, it was approaching, I think, around round 20. It was getting close to the finals and it still hadn't been uh, agreed no, upon. So no. that's, that threw a bit of a spanner in the works in terms of marketing. But hopefully with a bit of um, stability going forward, they can do a better job at getting fans to these games because, as you said, it's so crucial for the growth of our game. Absolutely, yes. Um, so, yes, um, tough loss for the Aussies, but what a great win for the Kiwis. And, yeah, geez, they look dangerous heading into any tournaments going they forward. Do. They do. Um, but we also had the Kumuls, PNG 32 defeated uh, Fiji 12, which was, again, similar to the New Zealand-Australia game, a complete um, reversal, reversal of the, of the result. previous week's result, yes, yeah. and... And deservedly so. And, um, you know, the Kummels were terrific. And um, I thought their key man was Edwin Apapi, the, yeah. Lee, the Lee player, who uh, looked great at dummy half mm. the whole afternoon. And uh, it, it was it was fascinating. Actually, quite a lot of Super League players were in that Papua New Guinea side, of course. We had D- Nen McDonald, the ex-Leeds, who is now a Salford player on, on the wing, Lachlan Lamott. Half back, Papi at hooker, Reese Martin at, in the second row, and um, I think yes, that's it, isn't it? Just, well, Liam Liam Horn, who's now come to Castleford, hasn't he? So mm. he was on the bench. So yeah, it um, it was a great performance by the by the Cummels, and and again, it'll be interesting to see what impact that has on their standings in the in the international rankings i think mm, yeah absolutely and yeah i think it came the result a week prior came as a bit of a surprise um fiji obviously have a great side as well but yeah the way edwin Ipape played through the middle uh, over the weekend was exceptional he scored himself a try i think he had like eight or nine runs from dummy half and, mm. and totaled over 100 meters so um he's a real weapon and a real threat and i think uh yeah he's got a lot of growth left to go in his game, which is scary for all other Super League oppositions. Oh, gosh, yeah. yes. Yeah, he's going to be a, a massive weapon. Mm. Uh, alongside Lachlan Lamb for, for, for Lee next year, you know, that's going to be really fascinating to see. And um, who are they going to get to partner Lachlan Lamb at halfback? Mm. At Lee, that's going to be an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I believe Derek Beaumont made some comments in the past week that they will be making a marquee song oh, yes, yes. Uh, in the future. So we'll have to stay tuned for that one. Mm. Um, but yeah, a really great result. And it was awesome to see uh, the fans of PNG every time the cameras panned up oh, to the stands, yes. how excited they They're were. They're marvellous, aren't they? Yeah, so yeah, Wouldn't really it be good gr- stuff. Go- great to go to a game there? I've never, I've never been there, sadly. Yeah. And uh, it's, one, it's one place I must visit before... Before I eventually, you know, walk out the door one day. Well, that's it. I think the thing too is um, a lot of NRL players or even even Queensland Cup players that have gotten the chance to go up there and, and play in PNG, they always speak so highly of, uh, you know, how they felt like oh, rock yes. stars rocking up at the airport and getting on the team bus. And mm. um, yeah, what an experience no that would be. About it. Um, now, we also had in the women's uh, England, 60 defeated Wales, Wales nil, I believe. And... Mm. Um, yeah, quite a quite a big scoreline, but uh, maybe a sign of, of how far England are going and, and maybe their potential uh, threat heading into the next Women's World well, Cup. Well, England are slowly professionalising, aren't they? And mm. it was inter- interesting to see Georgia Roach coming back from Newcastle Knights to uh, play in this game. They, she was the first woman of steel, of course, a few years ago, and she won the grand final with the Newcastle Knights in Australia this year. So great to see her coming back and playing for England. And uh, I think there are probably going to be more English players who head out to um, Australia again for their tournament because, of course, the um, I mean, although we are um, becoming more professional in this country with Women's Rugby League, with York having a whole slate of players, for example, now on professional terms, um, the money naturally is a lot higher in Australia. And, you know, the NRLW competition, I thought, was tremendously impressive this year. So it's um, it's going to be great, you know, for, 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 for women who want to play rugby league. But really, I, I, I thought Wales would give England a closer game um, at, at the weekend. And um, sadly, they weren't able to do that. Um, it, it, you know, it's a shame, though, because... <laughs> You know, I thought Wales competed very well in the first half, but then fell away 
as the game wore on. They just run out of gas, I think, to be honest. Mm. Um, but you know, great um, a great performance by 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 the English. Um, and um, you know, our reporter Lorraine had uh, Georgia Roach as the player of the game, and uh, I, I, I agreed with that. So mm. you know, but good luck to the Welsh, and I hope the Welsh continue to. Um, improve and um, you know get closer to us. They were quite close to the French the previous week, um, but it just sort of illustrated that England are way ahead of any other Northern Hemisphere countries in women's rugby league at the moment. Mm, we hope to see uh, further investment going forward, and obviously the potentials there. They only have to look at the NRLW to see. Uh, what potential is there? So, yeah. um, fingers crossed we can keep growing going forward. But um, in terms of the international calendar going forward, so the RFL is set to reconsider uh, its test venues in, in years to come. Mm. Um, I think Hull, Hull has been mentioned Hull and, and maybe Wigan. Wigan. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on, I guess, first of all, the stadiums or the venues for this year's series, do you think they were the right ones? And would well, you like the venues were okay, the but the, the, the problem that um, the RFL has is it doesn't have a big marketing budget and, um, you know, unfortunately it wasn't able to um, generate the um, support that really was needed. Uh, there's nothing wrong with um, St. Helens as a venue, nothing wrong with Huddersfield as a venue, but if they don't attract the crowds, then naturally you'll tend to look elsewhere. And, you know, I think there probably would be a bigger crowd in Hull. There's no doubt about that at, um, at, at, at the stadium there. And there would be probably more in Wigan as well, I would have thought. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly see those venues being um, used next year. But I, but I just hope um, that there's a bigger lead up and, and we're able to sell tickets, you know, earlier and more intensively for, mm. for for the series next year, assuming that it's against Samoa. Mm. Would you like to see any games feature down in London, or do you think it should just stick? Up I think it's difficult with Samoa to to go to London. Mm. Um, I know a lot of people would disagree with me, but I uh, I, I would tend to stick with um, the North of England for for those games. Really, uh, if I'm really honest about it, you know. And, and if you were going to go to London, you'd want to pick a stadium that was the right size. You know, I don't think there'd be any point in picking a a 60,000 stadium because you know with the best will in the world I don't think we'd attract that sort of um, crowd maybe a stadium of 20,000 perhaps that sort of figure would be would be fine um, but probably not more than that to be honest yeah yeah no, fair enough and um, would you like to see more planned fixtures against like France or um, any other nations from oh we've got to keep playing France mm. you know we've, we, we, we we had the um, we had the um, game against them midway through the season this year and beat them I think it was 64 nil wasn't it mm. and the women beat the French women by the same score as well but you know if if you don't persevere with these games I mean what we should be doing is playing in France mm. not not in in England because if you play it somewhere like Avignon or or you know uh, even Toulouse or you know now born or somewhere they will attract good crowds in France they mm. they tend to support international rugby league in uh, over there in in a way that would be diff- a, a difficult sell in England because everybody everybody would ant- anticipate a one-sided game mm. but we've got to persevere with France and you know there are a number of younger French players coming through the system at both Catalans and Toulouse and we've got to go for it really mm, absolutely and yeah a uh, great opportunity there to sort of develop continue, or keep developing French talent uh, with how well Toulouse went in the championship this year and mm. um, obviously they've got a really good IMG grading as well so um, you know we could see them approach Super League status in oh there's no doubt about it yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah really great stuff um Anything else international rugby league wise you want to touch on before we get into some of the other news? No, I think that's fine. Just uh, congratulations to France on winning the wheelchair rugby league Good. test match, which um, you know was um, a great result for them after losing last year's World Cup final. And that rivalry between France and England is, you know, a strong one. Mm. At that um, in that uh, particular 
branch of rugby league. So great to uh, great to see and um, good good luck to them. You know, marvelous win for for France. Yeah, absolutely right. It's great to see. Um, now, Martin, there's been a lot of uh, rumours swirling around uh, since the the end of the rugby uh, rugby union world cup around Owen Farrell and could we get him over to to Wigan uh, to feature in the Super League? Do you think? Um, we're sort of dreaming, thinking that we could get him to Super League to play for Wigan, or do you think that that's a real chance? Uh, well, Mike future? Danson, who's going to be taking over ownership of Wigan on the 1st of December, I think it is, um, if he's not taken over already, he's certainly got the funds to be able to do it, and he could, he could, um, you know, engage um, Owen Farrell as a marquee player and pay him anything, really, mm. um, because it would only count um um as 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 no no well up, up to a certain uh, only part of his salary would would count on the salary cap the um the problem i have though is that i think it's i mean owen farrell is a really great sportsman and a great rugby union player but and and when he was a kid he played um rugby league for wigan st patrick's of course his father is the great andy farrell um but when he's been out of the game for so long, it's difficult to come back into it and make the same impact that he has in rugby union. Mm. You know, he would have to relearn the game, and he's, you know, I think he's already 32 or thereabouts. It would be a very difficult thing for him to do, uh, and it would be difficult for uh, anybody, um, particularly Wigan, to know what position to play him in because, mm. you know, the playing at number six at standoff half in rugby league is so different to what he's used to playing in in in, in the other code um and you know you can't really afford to to play players who are not fully attuned to the game mm. um so you know it would be it would be an interesting exercise and i'm sure if if owen farrell did sign for wigan he would take it incredibly seriously and put a lot into it. There's no doubt about that. And he would be absolutely determined to succeed. He's clearly that sort of a guy. But I just think it would be very difficult. You know, having said that, you know, the best analogy um, is that fight that we saw last weekend when um, Nganu, Francis Nganu fought Tyson Fury uh, in, in a boxing match having never fought a boxing match before, but, but been in UFC, you know, he was able to adapt and took Fury very close. Mm. So maybe, you know, maybe Farrell could adapt that mm. quickly. I mean, I know that he's watched rugby, he watches rugby league religiously, um, watches an awful lot of it and, and studies it and so on, mm. and uses some of what he learns in rugby union. Uh, so, you know, who knows? It would be a fascinating move if it happened, wouldn't it? Mm. It might just be a pipe dream, but I just I sit here and wonder what a player of his profile could do for the game and just marketing-wise and oh, trying yeah. to attract some viewers from uh, Absolutely. rugby. I know back in Australia there was always rumours around uh, Quade Cooper uh, in his interest of playing rugby league at some stage. Never happened, career, though. It, it never really happened. So, and, and that's the thing. You did touch on like what position would he play because you know, some could argue he could play fullback, but the amount of running involved in rugby league with mm. our fullback, his fitness would have to be, you know, on point. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, who knows? We'll see what the future brings. It'd be great to see him in our competition, that's for sure. Um, but now, over the last week or so, Martin, you got the chance to catch up with the new Wakefield Trinity owner, Matthew Ellis. Um, you sat down, had a bit of a chat with him. What was your reaction to him and, and what were some of the things you got to talk about? Well, I think he's a great guy. Um, very determined to uh, bring Wakefield back right to the top of the tree in rugby league and the important thing is he's got the money to to do it if he wants to um, spend money he, he, he's said to me and it's on record here in league express this week that he's prepared to spend between 1.3 and 1.7 million pounds on the club next year i mean that's fantastic news for wakefield um he's going to make them a very strong side he's determined that they're going to get a grade a ranking next year with the IMG gradings and I think he probably will mm. um, and you know he's the guy who's brought Daryl Powell in as the um, Wakefield coach um, that that's his choice and uh, you know Daryl will no doubt be very keen to deliver success to Wakefield and I'm sure he probably will do 
Uh, so it's very exciting. It's, it, it, you know, Wakefield have never, ever had um, a wealthy benefactor until now. And it, it could transform the club completely. Mm. And obviously, you know, any Wakefield fan will hope that it will. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it's not just that um, Matthew Ellis, you know, is is determined to see the club do well on the field. But he's, you know, his, his business is um, DIY kitchens. And they um, are a massively successful family company. I think their last turnover last year was 92 million pounds and their profit level is about 12 million pounds their um, expected turnover this year is in excess of 100 million um, you know it, it, so the, the, they're amazingly they've done amazingly well as a family and it's just a real great thing to see you know him coming in coming into Wakefield and I can tell you from meeting him that he is absolutely full of enthusiasm mm. for this role. I mean, he's, he's, he's incredibly busy um, with his kitchen business. I mean, as he says in this article, they've opened two massive new showrooms this year and they've opened a new factory as well. So, you know, he's, he's got his work cut out as Matthew and, you know, he's working 18 hours a day. I th- you know, hopefully he can relax a bit as well because you don't want him to burn himself out. <laughs> but it's it's just great news for Wakefield and... The, the thought struck me when I was speaking to him that every club in the game needs somebody like him. You know, we, we've got other clubs like Salford who are struggling because of the lack of benefactor. We've got Castleford who could do with somebody like him as well, you know, and, and several other clubs that, that you know, are, are severely restricted by what they can do because they don't have the people on the board who, you know, can invest the sort of money that they need to become successful. And... Uh, Maybe there's a role here for somebody to set up a company that brings clubs and very wealthy individuals together. Mm. You know, if you um, if you if you fancy doing that, Jake, <laughs> just set, set it up and like a manager make, or something. <laughs> make make contact with very wealthy people, and uh, I mean, Jim Ratcliffe is the wealthiest man in Britain. He's buying Manchester United at the moment. Yep. See if you can persuade him to buy Salford instead. And if uh, if you could, the rugby league would owe you an awful lot. Um, so yeah, the you know the, it's it's great to see people coming into the game and and buying a club like that, and I I hope we see more of it elsewhere. Mm. And it must instill uh, a lot of confidence in the club, not only for the club itself, but players looking uh, for opportunities in the league at the moment. Like with the grading system at the moment, you'd have to think that they're a very good chance of playing Super League in in twenty twenty five. Um, do you think now players or free agents in the league right now looking at Wakefield thinking oh, we'll go be, play a championship now? And I can tell you now that every agent. agent in the game will be ringing up Wakefield with players to uh, try and um, persuade them to sign. There's, mm. You know, Once you say that you've got some money, there is plenty of people who want to take it off you. Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's no doubt about that, is there? Yeah, absolutely. And also, yeah, great to see that his business away from Wakefield is uh, thriving as well. Absolutely, so, yes. Um, yeah. And that, talk, that sort of investment, is that um, quite unheard of for a lot of clubs across well, Super League? Well, not necessarily. I mean, David Hughes at London Broncos is is known to invest at least a million pounds every year. Okay. Um and you know other you know Ken Davy at Huddersfield Giants, he in, he invests a similar sort of an amount. Mm. Another wealthy individual, um, so it's certainly not unknown for individuals to um, invest in, in in clubs, invest heavily in clubs, really. Yeah. Um, but you know, if if a club's in that situation, it's quite fortunate, isn't it, to mm. to have that sort of backing. Absolutely. It sounds like there's going to be a great rivalry uh, that will brew in the championship between Featherstone and, and oh, there's Wakefield. No doubt. There always has been a rivalry between yeah. Feathers. You know, I'm, 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 I was brought up as a Wakefield fan and um, I used to really look forward to going to Featherstone. Mm-hmm. And I used to look forward to Featherstone coming to Bellevue as well as a kid. You know, you always knew it was, it was always going to be a bit rough and, uh, you know, the, there was always a chance of um, some fairly strong arguments with, um, with Featherstone fans. But it was usually in great humour, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, <coughs> with one or two exceptions. But uh, no, the, it, both clubs are... I, I think both clubs will boost each other. And I think... Um, you know, I, th- I, th- I think Matthew Ellis will um, generate 
a lot of rivalry in the Wakefield district between Castleford, Wakefield and Featherston. Mm. Um, I think he's very keen on, you know, throwing down the challenge to the other two clubs to see who can get the best support and who can, you know, get the most publicity and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Because it must, it would be a challenge, I'd imagine, to try and retain those crowd numbers when you are relegated to a championship. Well, as he says, you look at Leeds United, for example, in football, who got relegated from the Premiership last year, but in the Championship, they're still getting 36,000 every Mm. week. You know, their football clubs fans tend to stay with them. Rugby league club fans often don't when things go wrong. Um, why that is, we could debate at, at length, really. But but he's confident of um, persuading people, the people of Wakefield, to really get behind his, um, you know, the, the, the team. I mean, he's he's going to, for example, print um, a flyer um, that will go around every home in Wakefield, promoting. Mm promoting Trinity and promoting season tickets and so on and so forth, which is the sort of thing that the club's never done before. So, you know, great stuff and let's hope it works. No, that's awesome. And obviously we've seen uh, the great success that Lee have had with uh, the backing of a wealthy of owner in yeah, Derek yeah. Beaumont. And I just want to touch on Beaumont quickly. I know we've spoken about him and um, even Adrian Lamb in this podcast, but the other day in an interview with uh, their um, Lee TV uh, sort of, weekly episode or whatever it is they do he was saying that he has a a five-year plan that includes adrian lamb in his vision uh, and he and he would expect lamb stays or he'll stay for the remainder of his contract which ends at the end of next year but do you think adrian lamb will hang around at lee following his contract if there are nrl clubs showing interest well if if he can get a first grade um nrl coaching position i think he'd go for it Mm. because after all he's australian and that would be the ultimate um the the ultimate you know job for him to to aim at um because at at some point he'll want to go back to australia not just to not to retire necessarily but to but to carry on with his career so but you know who knows when when that might be but at the moment there's no doubt about it he's very happy at um at lee and the, you know, I'm not surprised he is because they've, you know, had such a great season, and hopefully they'll have another one next next year. So I I don't think there's any doubt about that. Lee will keep going from strength to strength. I'm fairly sure. And uh, you know, again, they're another club that will be searching for a Grade A um, um, grading next year, and. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't surprise me if they got there, really. Mm, yeah, that's right. Because I think there was a few people saying that, you know, had they have not won the Challenge Cup, their grading might have been worse off than what it oh, is yeah. uh, this year. So, um, well, they'll lose that point two five of a point mm. next year, but I think they'll improve elsewhere. Mm, no, I hope so because it would be a, a great shame to see them uh, oh, this year. Ridiculous. This well, th- this, this is going. We, we we go back to this grading system, mm. and you know, I I emailed. Um, Tony Sutton, the RFL's chief executive, saying that you can't just go on gradings for who's going to be in the Super League. You've got to give, if you've got a B grade, you've got to give the B grade clubs the chance to win a position in Super League on the field, not Mm. just by a grading, you know, especially when there might just be point one of a point between clubs. But Tony has not yet replied to me uh, but I'm I'm not the only one who's been um, who's been emailing him, objecting to the grading system as it's currently um, configured. Mm. Um, and it, interestingly, the, the 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 most interesting thing in League Express this week, in some respects, is the readers' poll, mm-hmm. because last week we said, um, you know. Um, What's your view of the grading system proposed by IMG after the individual club gradings were revealed for the first time? And the most popular answer by far, with 62.72% of the responses, was that it's a foolish system that won't solve any of Rugby League's problems. Mm. So sixty-two, more than 62% of readers are opposed to this grading system. Right. Now that's got to ring alarm bells mm. for Tony Sutton and the RFL and people at RL Commercial, the Super League and so on, because the fans are not accepting it. Mm. It's a massive, massive change. The fans are not accepting it. 
And the danger is that if the transition season next year becomes a farce with London Broncos, you know, relegated before the, the season even begins, then people will switch off. Yeah. And, you know, I think Tony Sutton is putting his neck on the block, if we're honest about it, in, with, with, with this. And it's very brave of him to do it. He's, you know, he's just taken on board the IMG proposals without any amendment it seems in in, in, in this regard um, but I can't help feeling it you know it's, it reminds me a bit of the charge of the light brigade you know you're leading your leading leading us to destruction really mm-hmm. if we're not careful and you know I think it's as serious as that and uh, Tony I think he's is 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 going down the wrong avenue and if he doesn't change something you know, in the next week or two, I think we're going to have a bad season next year. Mm. You know, I did put a little clip up on our um, Total Rugby League Twitter last week. Just, uh, I think it might have been when we were talking about the London Broncos, and uh, a lot of the London Broncos fans replied to it. I think we were talking about whether it's worth them even competing if they know they're going to get relegated, or should they just pocket the money that they're given by the Super League and reinvest it in the club? And there seemed to be a bit of a divide. Some people were saying that, no, we want them to compete so they can, you know, uh, I guess prove the system wrong and make the Super League look mm. silly if they do get into, you know, playoffs and then oh, yeah. suddenly relegated. Others were saying that they would just like to see uh, the London Broncos sort of take that money and reinvest it into the club. Um, so it's, yeah, it's Well, the crazy thing is that the community. London Broncos could win the grand final next year and still not be in Super League the following year. Mm. Now, that has got to be crazy hasn't mm. it it's got to be crazy i mean i'm sure they won't win the grand final of course having said that but but they could do potentially there's you know if if um if if david hughes decided to buy all the best players in the world and bring them to london broncos for the start of next season they could win the grand final but they'd probably still be in a position to be relegated because their grading score wouldn't put them in the top 12 mm. and that just is just utter madness i'm mm. afraid it mm. really is no, oh, absolutely. Uh, well, we will see what happens. Uh, plenty of uh, months before the season will kick off. I'm absolutely, sure there'll be yeah, yeah. a lot more controversy before next year. I mean, the off. other thing that uh, Tony hasn't done, which I recommended to him in my email to him, was to merge the Championship and League One competitions. And they're, they're going with, um, you know, 14-team Championship and eight or nine-team League One, depending on whether Newcastle Thunder get to the starting line. And again, I think that's a terrible mistake. Mm. <clears throat> you know, I think we should have had a 22 or 23 team merged competition um, with a, a, a modified fixture list that I, I recommended to him. But um, but again, no response on that one. Mm. Yeah, crazy. And it'd be interesting to see what happens with Newcastle and yes. where they end up. Now, the other thing I was going to uh, bring up is still... Uh, no word on next year's schedule and Magic Weekend. Do you think that will go ahead next year? Oh, I think Magic Weekend will go ahead because the clubs want it. The crazy thing is that that's the, the IMG recommended that the Magic Weekend be discontinued, but this is where um, the RFL and the clubs have, have you know gone against IMG mm. and and want to keep it. And the same thing with the loop fixtures. They they want to keep the loop fixtures. Which again, I mean, I you know, I think is absolutely crazy, mm. um, but nonetheless, they they seem to want to retain them, and um, so we're going to have a twenty seven match season again next year with 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 the Magic Weekend. Mm. I just wish that both competitions, um, you know, would shorten the season and put more focus so on I. the international comp. You know? So do I. I mean, I you know, if, we, if we're going to talk about. International Rugby League and the future of International Rugby League, I think it should be held in July. I think I think the month of July should be given over to international competition on both sides of the world. And you could, you know, whether that's World Cups, whether it's Test Match Series, whatever it might be, I think it would be um, terrific to... Mm. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the problem with having international football in England in October and November... I mean, you're an Aussie, Jake, obviously, as we all know. Um, not many Australians want to come to England in October and November because the weather's so dull and, you know, it's cold, dark, wet and pretty horrible. Um, but if it was in July, um, it would be so much better. You know, we'd get far more Australians following Australia to England if we, if we held games in July. And similarly... 
uh, English people would go to Australia in July because the schools break up and people mm. could take their kids and everything and so on. It it would be, it would be terrific, and you know that's the way to go. But um, I'm I'm working on trying to persuade the people who run this game, but you know they they can be pretty stubborn mm. in terms of um, being amenable to change. I mean, having said that. Uh, it was me who was the original, I think, I, I, I like to claim this anyway, I was the original person who said switch to summer in this country back in the early 90s, and they eventually did, and it was me who said, look, end the season with a grand final, um, mm. and they eventually did. So I eventually, you know, I make suggestions and they eventually come about, but it sometimes takes quite a long time. Yeah, that's it. It's just about yeah. getting someone that will listen to you, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely, um, yes. But yeah, you're not wrong. It's uh, I think for the English people going to Australia in June, July, it's not as hot, so it'd be much favourable. Yeah, um, it'd be great. Well, I've been to Australia in July and it's, you know, it's great. Queensland in particular, of course. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely great. So you go in the middle of summer, it's you're looking at 35 too, degrees. It's too 40 hot. degrees. Yeah. It's, it's too, too bloody hot. hot. Um, but yeah, all right, Martin. Well, uh, anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up here today, mate? Well, I, I just again just just on this um, business with um, the um, grading system. Our mailbag this week is full of letters that um, object to it and say how farcical it is and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, some of them. I mean, not everybody fully understands the system, as you'll see if you read the letters. I think, but nonetheless. You know, it, it's 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 an alarm bell for the rugby football league that so many fans are um, so uh, dismissive of 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 what's a a really important aspect of the RFL's policy. Mm, yeah, absolutely right. I was just caught this caught my eye. This one here, the a hard tackles uh, no longer legal. <laughs> yeah. I 100 percent agree with that. I was um, disappointed on the weekend to see both uh, Maddie Pete and oh no not. not Matty Lee, sorry, and um, Kaloa Matangi Sinbind uh, for the hair pull and then the push and shove afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I just wish they had have said, boys, settle down, let's play on. Absolutely, <laughs> you know? yeah. The two yeah. yellow cards is a bit disappointing, but um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, what can you do? I guess with the the dangers of concussion at the moment, I think they've got to do everything they can to protect the players. But yeah, um, if I can just say something else, by the way, about League Express this week, we've got um, a review of Salford's season, which is. Uh, a really interesting one, and we've got a great feature, the Rugby League Heroes series that's that's written by Richard de la Riviere. Uh, we've got Brian Juliff, the great Welsh player, this week, and uh, you know a great sort of account of his career. And these articles are so interesting that Richard does, and of course he collected some of them for his book on Wigan. But um, you know it, it's um, it's a, it's a great piece, and I'd just like to um, send. My best wishes to Brian Juliff and his wife Anne because Anne is suffering from a, a really difficult disease at the moment. And, uh, you know, my best wishes to the Juliff family. And uh, Brian was always one of my favourite players when, when he played, for, especially for Wakefield. And uh, he's a great winger and a great Welshman. And um, I just hope that, uh, that they're looking for somebody who can be a donor for, for his wife at the moment. And um, I just hope that they can find someone. No, absolutely. And uh, if you do want to read that lovely article there by Richard, um, make sure you grab yourself a copy of the League Express newspaper. Yeah. You can grab your subscription if you want to get the online copy at www.totalrl.com forward slash shop. And finally, just on, on the subject of Wales, another um, Welshman, uh, John Phil Davis, the man who started the South Wales Scorpions a few years ago, he, he died on Sunday, I believe, and... Uh, my sincere condolences to to Phil Davis's family. He was a really enthusiastic Welsh rugby league guy. So mm. it's very very sad to see him go. No, absolutely. It's always sad when you see legends and greats uh, unfortunately pass, and it is. reminds you of your own mortality, I guess. And yeah, yeah. no, it's um, extremely sad, but they'll always be remembered for. Uh, the great impact they had on our game. Very much so, yes. Yeah, great. Absolutely. All right, Martin, well, we might wrap it up here. Um, That's marvellous, Jack. Thanks again to our listeners. Don't forget, if you do want to subscribe to the YouTube channel, you can find that at Total Rugby League uh, on YouTube. And don't forget to buy League Express. Absolutely. We'll still be going over the off-season, bar a couple of weeks over will, the Christmas yeah. period. We so, will, yes, I'm uh, delighted to say. I'm sure there'll be plenty of news. It's just <laughs> starting to warm up. I think there will. <laughs> great stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. Cheers. Thank you.